So one of the things I think that's important for people to think about when they're thinking about the patent system is why would you apply for a patent? And the short answer to that is there are many different reasons why different clients are interested in the patent system. It might be that they actually want uh, exclusivity and to generate a revenue stream. So for instance, in the pharmaceutical industry, you want a return on your R&D costs, so you want the exclusive rights to a pharmaceutical. Some people apply for patents to use as leverage to get funding. It can be a negotiating tool. Uh, it can actually be to stop other people from copying, blocking competitors. I have a client that is, has filed applications solely for the purposes of making an ASX press release. They, they knew the patent application was otherwise not novel or inventive, but it was for a strategic reason. They wanted an announcement in a particular space to attract some attention and hopefully some funding. We also have clients that sometimes file <coughs> applications or even oppose applications to get the attention of other people that they actually want to enter into a commercial agreement with. So we have one client who recently told us that they filed an opposition to a patent. So that is someone else had their application, patent application accepted and then these, the client of ours decided, okay, we want to stop that happening as a way to leverage a meeting with the other, other party. So there are a whole stack of reasons why people do want to file app patent applications and get patents. Um, and it's just something to keep in mind. There are, conversely, there are lots of reasons why you might not want to file uh, for a patent application. The system itself, it can be quite costly because you are required to get a granted right or you, to apply in each country. You need to spend money in each country for representation, for government fees, and the government fees alone in a lot of countries can be quite prohibitively expensive. So you need to think about things like the price point of the goods or services that you'll be offering and whether it actually is worth that kind of investment. Sometimes it might not be invested, if it, it might not be worth the investment if it's a very fast moving technology and just merely getting to, as some sort of first mover advantage, getting to market first would actually get you an edge over a competitor. Um, so we have like a lot of large famous companies like Coca-Cola have trade secrets and they would otherwise not divulge their you know, formula for making Coke, etc. So it's also entirely possible if you have say algorithms that work behind the scenes, you might have a control of the server and Mark might talk about the stuff. It might just be better, beneficial in the long term to keep the actual invention secret. What I do want to say though is because of all these sort of I guess the considerations you might have about whether to or to not apply, it's really important to talk to any commercial partners and to, your, to patent attorneys to talk about whether it is worthwhile. Most patent attorneys will give you time to come into their office and just talk about the system, talk about the pros and cons of possibly filing an application. But the most important thing is that we understand or your attorney understands what you expect to get out of the system, what you actually want the patent for. Because, oh, that slide didn't come up. That's a that was going to be a slide with all the things that, you're th that startups are thinking about in the commercialization process. So you have a lot of things in your head and attorneys typically like to just sit down and do patent attorney work, draft good patent applications that are gonna sail through examination and get accepted and be you know, rigid during enforcement. But sometimes you, you don't necessarily even want that. You, 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 your exit strategy might be to get out of it before the stage at which there are significant costs. And you might actually want to file a particular narrow right, like a, we have a, a second tier system that's called the innovation patent system. Some clients like that because they just want to have a specific neat invention that they're going to target a particular commercial partner with and then pursue another application to a broader approach a broader technology. So what's really important is that if you're talking to anyone, let them know your commercial objectives, the way you see the field, and what you want to get out of the system. Oh, there we go, it's all coming now, sorry. They're all the things that you're thinking about. These are the things that attorneys typically think about. So it's really important to discuss with your attorneys everything that's going on in your mind and what you expect to achieve and your exit strategy. So the system, the, pros, the system relies upon 
filing an application, which is called a provisional application, that sets your priority date. And then you've got up to 12 months to file a complete application that further describes the invention. The date that you file the provisional application sets your priority date, and that's the date by which novelty or the newness will get assessed. So anything that's been published prior to that is considered prior art. <coughs> and then you've got 12 months to file a complete application, further describing the invention. And frequently clients, people, will, inventors will file a PCT application, which is an international application um, under a system that allows centralised examination. And the thing that's important for um, inventors and cl our clients and startups is that that centralised examination also defers the costs of choosing the countries in which you need to pursue protection at a later stage. So following the filing of that complete application, you have another, about another 20 months almost to um, choose each specific country that you're interested in. So you have to choose those countries around the 30, 31 month mark from the earliest date. And that's when the major costs come in. So, so filing a provisional application does set in motion a series of timelines and that's really important to consider in a practical sense because at the 12 month mark you have the option of just refiling your provisional to reset the clock. Uh, we have many clients who do that but that is predicated on that you have not disclosed the invention in the meantime. So in my space people, people typically file a provisional application and then will go disclose the invention at scientific conferences and that almost forces their hand at the 12 month mark meaning that at 12 months they are required to take the next steps. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Otherwise, the international system defers costs to a much later stage. One minor point I want to make is when you're talking to investors and partners, there is a big difference between an application and that is just a patent application for which you've just filed the application, it hasn't been examined, you've had no opinion as to whether it's new or inventive versus a granted patent that actually has been examined that is an enforceable right. So people sometimes use the terms interchange interchangeably, but if you're talking to someone who's been around and knows the patent system, they'll be asking about you know, what stage it's at, has it been granted, have you got any search reports, uh, have you got any opinion as to the newness, inventiveness. So that's, a, that's an important distinction to know about. Um, one thing also is if you're thinking about filing an application, you can do your own searching. Um, you know the fee your field probably a lot better than other people. Searching is, however, an art. There are a lot of patent databases that you should search and know about. Um, but you can begin before talking to an attorney by actually doing your own searches. It's actually, uh, you can get a professional search done. That's typically quite expensive to do. Um, for reasons I won't go into now. Um, but it's also possible if you file a provisional application to get the Australian Patent Office to do a search for you. And that costs us a reasonable, well, it's actually not a significant government fee, but they'll give you a novelty type search, so they'll give you an opinion. And sometimes that's a of benefit when you're actually approaching commercial partners. You can say you've filed something and you've got a preliminary opinion. The other thing to keep in mind is timing. So not only does filing that first application set the clock for the subsequent steps and possibly things to think about, like not talking about it um, even after you've filed an application, it's also really important to not actually s sell the product or s negotiate sales or seek commercial benefit before you file any applications because that can otherwise uh, be fatal to subsequent applications. So you want to file an application before any disclosure. It's also common that people will uh, seek funding and seek sales before they've filed an application and that can be fatal. So it's ideal if you keep, keep it in secret before you file the first step. And then other considerations, this is my final point, is inventorship. Frequently inventions come about from the input of multiple people and at the beginning of an invention when everyone's working together on the invention, it's actually a good time to discuss inventorship and contribution and get assignments in place of so basically the inventors assigning their rights in the invention to the company or the startup, the entity. Um, what can happen is that relationships sour over the years it takes to get a granted patent, people die, people move on, people get fired. 
and frequently that means people are reluctant to sign, assi sign assignments. It's ideal to have them done very early for our purposes anyway, but it can be extremely difficult to get signatures three or five years down the track. So this is something to really think about at an early stage. So that's it for my section and now I'll hand over to Mark. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, patents for software specifically. Um, it's my Twitter details there if you want to follow me or send me a tweet. <coughs> um, Mark mentioned this before, but um, it's worth repeating. If there's one thing you remember from what we've talked about today is this, this notion of if you want to go down the path of patent protection um, to, to file first, then disclose. Um, public disclosure of your invention prior to filing can destroy your patentability. Um, there are some outs. So Australia and the US, for example, have a, a grace period where you might be able to save your rights. Um, but a number of jurisdictions don't, uh, notably Europe. So the message is if, you, if you're going to pursue patent protection is to file first um, and then go public or disclose. So, uh, well, what is patentable? It's almost easier to talk about what isn't patentable. Um, the sort of things that are patentable are, you, like Mark mentioned, just sort of devices, methods, process, apparatus. Um, things that aren't patentable are things like discoveries. If, if you discovered a mineral in the ground, <laughs> if it's a naturally occurring mineral, um, that's not a, a thing that's patentable. Um, if you discovered that mineral and then worked out that it was quite difficult to process it and in some way extract um, the good properties of that material, that, that aspect of what you're doing might be patentable. Abstract ideas aren't patentable. That's the sort of thing where maybe you've got an idea for something but you've got no real detail as to how it might work. Um, schemes and plans aren't patentable subject matter either. Um, a scheme or a plan might be a, how to get rich quickly or how to improve the government. It, it, may, it may well be a good idea, it may well be a, an elaborate plan, but it's not the sort of thing you can get a patent for and therefore stop other people from doing. And the other thing that's not patentable is mathematical formula. It, it may be possible to patent something, a method which includes a formula, but the formula itself is not patentable. And the other thing to notice is that uh, certain jurisdictions have exclusions on patentability. Um, in particular, um, some countries have exclusions on patents for human beings, um, medical treatments, and notably for software, particularly um, in a big jurisdiction for us, which is Europe, um, there is a slight restriction on the, the extent to which you can get patents in Europe for software, which I'll talk about in a moment. So from the point of view of Australia, um, software patents are, are patentable in Australia. Um, <laughs> generally, it's no problem. There's, there's two major s tests, and this applies for any type of patent subject matter. One is novelty. Has, has it been done before anywhere in the world? Um, and the second one is inventive step. Is what, what you've done obvious? So they're the two main tests. That will generally come up during the examination stage, which Mark talked about earlier. Um, not at the first filing stage. The third thing is, it's a, it's a peculiarity to Australia and the UK, is this notion of manner of manufacture, which really comes down to the subject matter and whether it's the sort of thing that we can get a patent for or not. Um, and in the case of software in Australia, that is possible to get, it is possible to get protection for software, but not for pure business methods. So we have a case from a few years ago, um, Grant, where it was an asset protection method, um, which is basically a financial tool, but was not really implemented in any technology. It was just a pure way of doing business. And that in Australia has, found, has been found not to be patentable. Things have got a bit complicated in the software space in Australia in the last few years in terms of patentability. Um, but as of today's date, um, the sort of thing that's patentable in Australia is if it's computer implemented, um, it produces some sort of concrete, tangible, physical or observable effect. That can happen in memory. It doesn't have to physically happen on a bit of hardware or some associated bit of apparatus. Um, and the computer has to have direct involvement um, with the invention. So um, at the moment, you can't have, um, I guess, a business method dressed up with some software attached to it to make it look like it's, it's a... Uh, computer implemented invention of a business method. So there's a little bit 
at the moment we've got a little bit of um, an issue with a couple of federal full federal court judgments which are about to come out. We've got sort of two differing opinions as to what uh, to what extent software is patentable in Australia. One is for a, a case for research affiliates where we've got, it was found that a method for generating an index <coughs> representing value of stocks was not patentable. Um, that the technology there is quite complicated, um, but unfortunately in the specification there wasn't an awful lot of detail as to how this is actually carried out on a computer. RPL Central um, was found to be patentable subject matter and it's software, but it's quite simple. It was a method for gathering evidence for the purposes of assessing competency uh, relative to a standard. So you effectively the invention was you go onto a website, answer a questionnaire about what you've done before in a particular field, and then you might get a, a couple of uh, subjects knocked off uh, from whatever course you were doing based on what you'd answered in that questionnaire. Um, but that was found to be patentable subject matter, despite the fact that it seems a little bit more simple than the method for generating stocks. Um, in short, we're waiting on the results of these judgments, which we expect to happen in final quarter of this year, which hopefully will provide clear guidance on what sort of stuff and to what extent software is patentable in Australia. Um, we hope. So at the moment, it's hard for us to advise generally, we have to look on a case by case basis. But if you're doing something really technically interesting with a lot of processing and not really involving a business method, then generally speaking, it is patentable subject matter. Um, so in the meantime, we would recommend you get advice first to see whether or not um, we think it's the sort of thing you should even bother filing a patent for in Australia. Um, and, in, and in particular, at the moment, there's a real need for in the patent specification to really nut out in detail what it is that this invention is doing, what the advantages are, how it technically works, really providing a lot more information than we had than we have done previously. So that's Australia. We're in a little bit of a state of flux, but probably I think you can still file software patents in Australia provided you've got some sort of technical element to them. Other jurisdictions are different. Um, the US used to be you can patent anything under the sun. Um, that has changed a little bit. It's tightened up a little bit. Um, we've had a decision recently in the Supreme Court of the US, which is the highest court in the US, uh, in Alice Corporation versus CS CLS Bank. Um, that basically related to a computer implemented scheme for reducing settlement risk um, in financial transactions. Um, so that was found not to be patentable subject matter. Um, it, it was quite a broad claim. So the claim basically <coughs> in words defines what they're trying to stop people from doing. But um, our view is, is that, I mean, had that particular corporation, Alice Corporation, had they uh, described a bit more of a narrower version of what they were doing with a bit more technical implementation, that may well have been a patentable subject matter in the US. So from our point of view, um, that Alice Corporation decision hasn't changed much um, of what's patentable in the US than it was a year ago. Um, anything that's in software that's doing something new, that's beyond the mere application of an abstract idea or business method, then it probably is patentable subject matter. Europe, Europe is a little bit different. Uh, it's not to say you can't protect software in Europe, but there needs to be a, a technical character to the invention. So for example, um, you need to have something like uh, um, improved, say, processing speed. If you can, if you can <coughs> have that as part of, that's one of the advantages of the invention, or that's what the invention is doing. Um, if you're reducing memory, um, if, you, if you've got some sort of invention which is couched in software, which results in improved profits for your shareholders, um, that simply wouldn't fly in Europe. So that's where it's important to get advice from attorneys as to whether or not you should bother filing in a certain jurisdiction because if you had that sort of patent in Europe, you'd be wasting your money filing it there. Japan also allows uh, business methods and also um, software patents. They are moving towards this more technical side of things where you have to show some sort of technical effect, similar with Japan, so similar with China. So China and, and Japan are probably moving towards a US model. Um, as long as there's technical detail there, generally patentable subject matter. Here's just a couple of examples of um, software patterns um, that are interesting to me and um, you might be familiar with some of these. I don't know if you remember 
um, it's a guy, Rick Richardson. He, he was on Australian Story a few years ago, but he, he basically took on Microsoft for patent infringement for this patent. This is a US <coughs> patent. It was filed in uh, early 90s, 1993. And this, this is software directed to, um, in the old days, you'd get a CD <coughs> with your software on it. The, the entire program would be on the CD, but only a certain portion, I guess a demo portion, would be available to you as an end user. You get the CD for free, um, but in order to activate the CD, you used to have to call up, give your credit card details, you get a number, you put in the number, the, the CD works. Um, but what Rick realises is that, um, that that might not be so easy if you have someone using a different machine um, and, and transferring it to a different machine. <coughs> so what he had was a bit of software which basically um, generated a particular number which is unique to the CD, where the CD was loaded on a particular computer. So he sued Microsoft for over $300 million in damages, I think, and won. Um, and that was about three or four years ago. Uh, so this patent expired, it's going to expire soon, so it's a 20 year term. So that's an interesting one from Rick, he's an Australian inventor. Here's another sort of thing that's patentable subject matter, um, certainly in Australia and the US, possibly also in Europe. Um, it's for the uh, cover flow technology, which you would know from if you've ever had an, an iPod or if you've used iTunes. Um, this is basically directed to the software which provides this functionality of the swiping album covers to the left and right. Uh, this wasn't an Apple um, invention. Um, a small startup came up with this and then sold it to Apple. Um, speaking of Apple, this is a, uh, an invention which was the subject of some litigation uh, between Apple and Samsung recently, which is now all settled. Um, but it relates to that, that pinch and zoom that you have on your iPhone. Um, again, patentable subject matter. This is both physical and software. So there is a physical thing going on with capacitance between two layers of um, film. But at the same time, there's software to determine where you are, where your, where your fingers are on the, the pad or the screen um, relative to each other. So that's all patentable subject matter. And that would be patentable subject matter in Australia, US and Europe. Um, similar to what Mark was talking before, why, why patent or well, why patent software in particular? Um, one good reason is that copyright, uh, while it will protect the code you've written, um, it won't protect the, exp the way the idea works. So someone could, in theory, um, you could have copyright in the code, but someone could easily recode and come up with the same functionality for the software. Whereas patents protect the way <coughs> things work and any way you might want to implement it. Um, again, Mark mentioned this before, but just protecting that core technology that you have to deter copycats. Um, the other thing is uh, you can generate revenue, um, you can license, um, you can also cross license. So it might be that you want to use a particular feature in, in your software um, and it's called if someone's got a patent on that but they might want to use what you've got so you can cross license uh, you also can send a message to your competitors that you're serious about protecting your intellectual property um, it, for, for a lot of our clients particularly startups um, it's attractive to investors sometimes VCs want to see it um, they want to see that you've had a, a provisional application at least on foot and, and as I mentioned before that needs to happen before you go live um, before you start offering to sell this to people. Uh, but at the same time, you need to be a bit sensible about whether or not it's worth filing. Um, you have to consider the lifespan of the software. Um, patents take in, in the order of years to obtain. Japan, uh, maybe five, six years. Malaysia, if you ever file there, you're looking at 10 years. Um, of course, you've got a pending right in all that time, and ultimately you can sue someone back to the date that the application was published. But it may be that at that stage everyone's moved on and so you really need to think about um, the, the time frames. Also the market you're in is that the sort of the software you're providing is so niche that you have the market sewn up already even if there was a competitor you have relationships with all the main the main players. You need to think about whether it's worth, worth it or not. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about apps because I must get at least <coughs> one inquiry a week uh, about apps. Um, apps are no different to software, they are software, um, provided what you've got is novel, new, hasn't been done before, and is not obvious, 
it is probably patentable subject matter. Um, at, at protection for apps is most powerful where you've got something that's uh, clever or underlying the app, um, maybe something interesting other than just standard um, sort of functions you see in apps, something that maybe other people might want to use to make a similar app, not copying your app, but developing from your app. If you own the technology at the base level, they'll need to come to you before they can make an app that's, that uses your functionality. Um, and that's attractive to you. Uh, but again, consider the lifespan of the app. If the app's the sort of thing that is going to be a flash in the pan and no one cares about it in December, um, there's no point going on an extensive filing regime in every country in the world for patents if no one cares about this app in six months' time. Also, the market you're in, if, if it's a sort of app that um, you've got traction and you've, you, you, for example, have it on a whole bunch of people's iPhones and they need to sort of interact with their friends who also need the app, um, you may well have competitors, but it might be that you're the preferred app that everyone uses and maybe a trademark which David will talk about shortly, is better in that situation. So you just need to be a bit sensible about whether or not it's worthwhile, particularly for apps and particularly where it's short-lived. Um, I guess the only thing I think I really want to get across is this idea of looking at pr protection before you go live or disclose. Um, <coughs> and again, like Mark mentioned earlier, patents are granted on a country-by-country -country basis. Um, if you're in software, you need to probably get some interim advice from an attorney to see whether or not what you've got is patentable in Australia and or your major countries of interest. And as Mark mentioned before, you, we're talking here about getting your own rights. You also need to be aware of other people's rights. So you need to think about whether what you're doing is infringing anybody else's rights because that might stop you from doing what you're doing as well. Um, so that's my contact details. I'm at MJWIP. And uh, Philip Zorman Fitzpatrick's uh, Twitter account is uh, POFIP. Uh, feel free to follow us or look at what we're doing. And I'll hand you over to David, who's going to talk about trademarks. And uh yeah, unlike uh, Mark and Mark here, uh, I work in the, uh, the legal group at uh, Philip Zorman. Uh, most of my work is IP litigation, and um, I generally get involved when the uh, relationship has turned sour or someone's infringing or um, you're infringing someone else so uh, I guess I'm a little bit more um, typical lawyer in terms of being careful and think 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 and trying to avoid needing to come and see me in the first place um, so I'll just talk briefly about copyright um, trademarks uh, confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements uh, and uh, hopefully go through some tips and traps that we regularly come across uh, along the way. Uh, firstly, trademarks. We probably already uh, know this, but a trademark is uh, a sign that distinguishes uh, one trader's goods and s or services from those of another um, in the course of trade. And trademarks can be many forms, um, your typical words, uh, Kodak, Cadbury, Verve, Clicko, just some options. Uh, a device mark or a logo mark, uh, which can be just fancy script for a word or a word together with uh, some sort of image. Uh, they can also take on uh, different forms for trademarks. You can have uh, colour trademarks. Uh, the colours that I've got up there are the yellow, if that's what it is, for Kodak, uh, registered in for film. Uh, purple for Cadbury, registered in respect of chocolate, and the last one is Verve, regis registered in respect of, uh, in, of wines. Scent trademarks. There's only one scent trademark registered as far as I could see, and it's uh, Eucalyptus Radiata for golf tees. I'm not sure if any of you play golf, but I haven't come across it yet. Um, it's filed a while ago, but who knows, they might catch on uh, eventually. Sounds, there's quite a lot of sound trademarks registered. Um, McCain, ping, you've done it again. But all sorts of those catchphrases that you hear in ads all the time, oh, 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 O'Brien, that's a registered trademark for the sound of the oh, 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 O'Brien. You can't say that <laughs> to advertise your own product if you wanted to. And finally, shape. Uh, shape trademarks are, um, can be very, very powerful rights. 
Uh, the two examples I've put up there is the shape of the big pen uh, and the shape of the Coke bottle. Uh, we've just uh, finished a couple of months ago a big litigation on behalf of Coca-Cola against Pepsi in relation to the shape of their bottles. So no doubt if you do drink Pepsi, you've been confused all this time about drinking Coke. Um, why would you register trademarks? Well, I guess they're relatively cheap compared to patents. Um, significantly cheaper and they can last forever as long as you keep paying your fees and no one attacks them. Uh, the trademark will be a, a, a provide you with monopoly of unlimited duration. And during that time, you can capture all of the value into that trademark or brand. So all of your advertising, all of your sales, all of your reputation can all be captured into a registered right that can be sold, licensed, um, used in advertising. And it's a good way to capture that value into something that's tangible and build the brand up as you go along. Um, like patents, trademarks are registered rights. They can be searched. You can say that you've got a registered trademark. There's a little R symbol in a circle, and that can deter uh, competitors from adopting something that's similar, prevent them from entering the market in the first place. Um, uh, geographical coverage is another advantage. It's they're national rights like um, uh, patents, but if you don't register a trademark, you might have the most popular burger joint in Melbourne, uh, but it's your reputation and your rights would only extend to Melbourne. So someone could come to Sydney, open the exact same um, chain or store, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. With a registered trademark, it's nationwide, uh, you can prevent them from doing it, regardless if anyone's heard, heard of you in, in Sydney. Uh, a registered trademark or the use of a registered trademark is also a complete defence to trademark infringement. Um, and much simpler way of enforcing your rights uh, in a reputation by having a trademark. You can wave a piece of paper in people's faces, it's a registered right, and you don't have to prove your reputation or sales or rely on um, much harder to establish uh, facts. Um, some trademark tips that we find particularly where people are coming up with a new concept or a new brand, there's a huge temptation to come to have a trademark that's descriptive of the goods. Uh, the kind of people think, oh, what everyone's going to type into Google to search for what I want to offer. That's the trademark that I want, so it'll come up. And it's great if you're the first one and you get a couple of months. But pretty soon everyone adopts descriptive marks for their own businesses, which are close to yours. And in five years' time, you do a Google search and you don't know where yours is going to be. The best trademarks have nothing to do with the goods that they're uh, sold. Like Apple has nothing to do with computers, for instance. Um, you know, Porsche doesn't have much to do with cars. So don't fall into the trap of being too descriptive. We did have a case, a very sad one, for a client of ours, Persian Feta. I don't know if you know it. It's marinated feta. Um, and they had a very successful product, a registered trademark. It was licensed. A lot of people used their trademarks to sell um, what they called Persian feta uh, as well. Um, ultimately, uh, in trying to enforce that mark, uh, it was found to be uh, invalid by the court in that it was descriptive and should never have been registered. Uh, and you'll find there's a lot more Persian fetters in the supermarket now which is good if you love marinated cheese, but uh, not so good for our client. Um, the other thing to note with trademarks is registering a business or company or domain name does not give you proprietary rights in that name. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you have a company name, Joe Bloggs Proprietary Limited, you can't prevent anyone else from using that just because of your company name. Uh, there are rules preventing people from uh, making representations that they're you when they're not, uh, but generally trademark is the only right that's going to give you those proprietary rights in a name and prevent other people from using it, uh, distinguish their goods uh, from those of others. Uh, and one thing to note with trademarks is that you should obviously uh, search and do your research before commercialising. Uh, don't pick a name with trademark issues with other people or that you can't secure a domain name, it's good to get these things uh, sorted early. I uh, just wanted to talk about uh, 
copyright, um, a little bit, you probably already know all this. As Mark said, in the software field, uh, I guess there's a, a shift towards uh, patents for software, um, but there are circumstances where uh, that's not going to be appropriate, as, as Mark outlined. Uh, and also, um, copyright, one big advantage is you don't have to do anything. There's no system of registration. As soon as you create something and put it in a material form, you have copyright in that in that form. So copyright is a bundle, a bundle of rights. It's the exclusive right to reproduce, publish, uh, communicate to the public uh, the creative work. So um, copying is the most obvious uh, or the most used right. Uh, and it covers a whole range now of creative works. They don't need to have any artistic quality but will be literary, dramatic works. Probably the most relevant for the IT space is um, literary works. It will protect uh, code and software. Um, artistic uh, works could pr protect the look and feel of a, uh, of a product in, in the software field. Uh, it doesn't protect the ideas. Uh, patents protect the ideas. Copyrights only the material form. Uh, and uh, it lasts, or copyright, will go for the life of the author plus 70 years. So it's pretty long and uh, it'll still be going when you're not around. Um, I'll just make a quick comment about copyright in apps. Uh, as I said before, <coughs> app software is protected as a literary work uh, in copyright. Um, Whilst it doesn't protect the idea, it does protect the, um, the result of your you know, labour in actually creating the content and you know, what it looks like and how it works in some uh, the look and feel uh, of, of an app in some instances. And um, because you don't have to do anything to register uh, the copyright and it subsists without you having to, to pay money uh, for occasions where you have a something of a limited lifespan, a copyright m might be your primary uh, licensing tool, uh, particularly given that uh, there are distribution or you can distribute your app through various stores like the Apple store or the Android store. Um, uh, having uh, something that people can't copy without some royalty or license f flowing back to you uh, is a significant advantage. Now just a couple of points to note in relation to copyright, uh, just because it's on the internet, if there's images or something, it doesn't mean that you can use it. Um, it's probably the most common trap that we find people fall into. Uh, they f see a picture or something or a sound, incorporate that into their own work, uh, but it's protected by someone else's copyright. Uh, you should assume that everything you see uh, on the internet, uh, unless it's stated otherwise, there's uh, copyright subsisting in it and you're not free to use it other than for personal purposes. Uh, there are, uh, if you're interested, plenty of available um, uh, Creative Commons websites that have free images and sounds uh, and uh, uh, film recordings available for, for use and um, you should make use of them if you need to. And um, just remember to be vigilant. Uh, it's if you do have something that uh, infringes someone else's copyright and your app is the latest and greatest next big thing, you can very quickly rack up uh, a potential liability with widespread distribution of that app through uh, the various uh, app stores. So then I, now I just want to talk a little bit about confidentiality and disclosure agreements. We didn't coordinate that much. Um, in our talks before coming here, but it's clear that patent attorneys always think about <laughs> keeping things secret and not telling anyone anything. Um, I'll reinforce that motion. Um, you can lose your, your ability to file patents if you disclose, and um, I guess that's, if you take home anything from uh, our three talks, that's, that's the one thing. Think about it early and don't, don't disclose. Um, so, Consider if you do need to talk to someone um, or disclose your, your invention or your idea in order to develop it or seek funding or collaborate, 
uh, consider using a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, so non-disclosure agreements, pretty simple, just an agreement that prevents um, the person receiving confidential information from disclosing that information uh, uh, to others. A couple of things to consider about non-disclosure agreements. Uh, who's going to be bound by the agreement? Does it go both ways? Um, if you're talking to potential collaborators or investors, uh, is it just them who are going to be bound or are you also <coughs> going to receive information? Um, so do you need an agreement that's mutual or one way? Uh, the definition of confidential information, uh, you need to have a think about that. Most of the agreements use uh, standard or boilerplate clauses often just taken from the internet, which is a pretty general broad description of what confidential information is. But if you're going to be disclosing particular things that might not be uh, the usual type, you need to make sure that any agreement covers those uh, to avoid any disputes later. You need to think about how the information can be used. Uh, if you're disclosing it to a potential collaborator, they may need to disclose it to their partners in order to uh, progress the project. Do you need to think about uh, that in terms of uh, the agreement before you do it? Um, do you need the person who's disclosing the information, do they need to keep it uh, and maybe workshop the, the idea for a period of time? Should they keep that information secret um, in a locked filing cabinet or take some steps to protect the confidentiality of, confidentiality of your information? Uh, because once something becomes public, uh, that's it. Um, and think about you know, whether you want them to delete and tell you that they've deleted the information or return any papers you give them uh, and uh, how long uh, you want the, the term uh, of that agreement. Is it just for the purpose of negotiations or um, making funding decisions or is it going to be ongoing for the length of the project and beyond? Um, now, non-disclosure agreements, what if they're not appropriate? Uh, in our experience and anecdotally, we understand that if you are in a position where you can pitch to a venture capitalist or a potential investor, they'll tell you they, don't, they won't sign a non-disclosure agreement and, and that you, you've already taken three steps back from even talking about it. They're too busy. If you need to have an NDA, they don't want to hear from you. Anecdotally, that's what happens. And um, there are several things that you can do. I mean, I guess, the first point would be if you filed your patent application already and secured at least your application and that priority date, you can be free to disclose that information without uh, jeopardising your ability to file patents later. Uh, but consider whether you can adjust your disclosure or your pitch uh, without giving away what you think should, needs to be kept secret or what's uh, the magic formula, as it were. You can have high level documentation. Uh, and then deliver details as necessary verbally. Um, one, I guess, tactic that can be used in those situations is to um, disclose information on the understanding of everyone that it's going to be confidential. If I say to you, you know, do you mind if I share these details with you in, in confidence? Most people are going to say, yeah, sure, just tell me. Um, and that's a verbal agreement that they'll keep the inf information confidential. You can follow that up the next day saying thanks for hearing, you know, thanks for talking with me or spending the time um, and agreeing to keep uh, our discussion confidential, appreciated and just document uh, that, um, that agreement uh, post facto NDA. <laughs> um, and I guess one thing to think about is if disclosing the the information is the only thing that's required to prevent, uh, or if non-disclosure is the only thing that's going to prevent everyone else from adopting and implementing your idea, consider whether you need more development uh, and, and work uh, in that, on that idea. Um, I just wanted to give a quick example of um, a company, not $300 million that Mark came up with for uh, Rick, was it Rick Richardson? Uh, but one of our clients, PBR Australia, 
Uh, they develop brake technology, a very small engineering <coughs> company based in Melbourne. Um, it was the kind of technology that can really only be um, uh, done in conjunction with major players. So they needed to talk to uh, big companies in order to um, implement, I guess, and finalise that technology. Uh, they obtained patent protection and then went and talked to various people. That brake technology is now in pretty much every car er around the world. Uh, and they're a global player uh, in brake technology uh, from very simple beginnings. And I mean, I guess the message there is that they thought about it early. They knew they were in a kind of technology where they would need to talk to people and disclose and collaborate in order to develop that information. But they had their protection in place uh, early. Uh, and uh, it worked out. Um, now, just a tip for startups in terms of what I see. We mentioned, I mentioned that we see a lot of disputes. Well, quite often um, it's because people don't get the, uh, the foundations right. Um, startups, uh, particularly in the sort of you know, young entrepreneur space, are often done with friends and when everyone's uh, thinks everything's fantastic and hunky-dory and it's all happy days uh, but the relationship can sour and the honeymoon period doesn't last uh, and um, think you need to think about that early and take into account uh, in getting the basics right setting up your company or whatever vehicle that you're going to use to commercialize your invention or your ideas um, and if there's multiple people, who's going to do what? Uh, who gets what percentage of the company? How do you boot someone out if they're not doing their job properly? Um, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, when you sort it out when everyone's happy, get it in writing, uh, and then you will avoid disputes down the track. And it is a very, very common area uh, of disputes that, that we see. And uh, finally, uh, just a few uh, take-home points. Um, I guess for us, and it probably covers a lot of uh, what Mark and Mark said, but um, think early about identifying your, your IP. Um, multiple intellectual property regimes may be appropriate. Um, patents, trademarks, copyright, uh, all of the above. Um, think early and, uh, and consider what's appropriate for you. Have your business plan. Think about the costs, the type of market you're going to be in, the lifespan. Um, do that early uh, and, uh, and get it in place. Uh, understand how you're going to uh, get to the, the end point. Well, think about the end point uh, from the start and you'll have a smoother ride. Um, <coughs> I don't want to bang on about not disclosing anything again. I think you've got that. <laughs> uh, uh, use your intellectual property. Um, that's really all uh, we want you to do. Make sure that you can use it for whatever purpose you want. It might be to generate income or attract funding. Uh, but the purpose of um, thinking about your intellectual property and or obtaining rights, if that's appropriate for you, is that, that you can uh, do it early, get that in place, and then utilise it to the, uh, the best of your ability. Uh, I think that was uh, all from me. Um, thanks.